Good evening, everyone. Your Eminence, Your Grace, Bishops, Pro Chancellor, colleagues, and friends. Some of them are old friends and some of them new, but we're delighted to be able to have you here at the university this evening and to have you here in our Senate room. It's one of two or three chapels. Remember, we are coming, we were. We are a coming together of three different colleges, and each of them had chapels. And this chapel, still sacred space, is the Senate room where the university makes its major academic decisions. So it's a good place to meet and to have this lecture. COVID has delayed and disrupted our lives, hasn't it? It's delayed this lecture at least twice, and it's the third time that we're trying to have it, and here we are. It's disrupted the life of the university, as it's done with so many things. The thing about Liverpool Hope is that being a church foundation, it is determined to be a collegium. It's the best way we can explain that we're not a large, amorphous, inner city place. We're a campus, a garden campus, where individuals matter and community matters. And collegium, as you know in Latin, means simply fellowship. It's in the fellowship of academics and students that real learning takes place. And that is what this university is about. So what we've missed most is this coming together in one place. And this is probably the second event after the restoration. The restoration began in September when our lectures began on campus again, and we refused to have this hybrid mix of online and on campus. And so with the help of our colleagues, our academic colleagues and all the support staff, we managed to pull it off thus far, um, Omicron notwithstanding. But thank God we are where we are and we can see each other face to face. And Cardinal Fitzgerald, it's a joy to be able to have you with us here in Liverpool and to have you here this evening to talk to us. I'm going to invite my colleague, the Head of Theology, Professor Peter McGrail, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, and good evening, everybody. I'm Father Peter McGrail, and as you just heard, I'm the Professor of Liturgical Theology here at Liverpool Hope. Before I introduce our distinguished lecturer this evening, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone and particularly to acknowledge the presence here of a number of distinguished guests. I do so with the immediate apology in case I miss anybody out. We're delighted that Archbishop McMahon is with us as also Bishop Tom Williams, who is of course one of our previous distinguished lecturers. We also have with us the deans of both the cathedrals, the very Reverend Sue Jones from Liverpool and Canon Tony O'Brien of the Metropolitan Cathedral. And we are also delighted to welcome the Reverend Crispin Paling, the rector of Liverpool Parish Church, who I understand enjoys a very neighborly relationship with our lecturer this evening. I'm also delighted to welcome Professor William Horbury, retired scholar of intertestamental studies. And last, but by no means least, I'd like to recognize members of our governing council, not least our pro-chancellor, Canon Peter Wynne, to the heads of some of our partner schools and other friends of the university this evening. Now, I do not suppose that there are many Catholic priests who can say that when they were away on vacation, a cardinal stood in for them. However, I am such a priest. I returned from holiday, I think it was last year, but with COVID, everything sort of melds together, to find that a very nice Father Michael had celebrated the Sunday Mass at the convent that I serve. And it only slowly dawned on me that Father Michael was in fact Cardinal Fitzgerald. And by the sound of it, you enjoyed being with the community of the poor servants of the Mother of God on Edge Lane every bit as much as they enjoyed having you. Now, actually, over the course of his long and varied career, our lecturer this evening 
has been equally at home, I'm sure, in our convent's little chapel, filled as it is with the roar of traffic heading in and out of the city, as he has been with the marble halls of the Vatican or with the seats of government. Cardinal Fitzgerald has served as a pastor, as an academic, as a diplomat. But above all, he has and continues to be a man of dialogue, especially between Christians and Muslims. Generally considered to be one of the Roman Catholic Church's leading experts on Islam, his personal philosophy can be largely summarized in his statement that Christians and Muslims together make up about half of the world's population. If we can live in peace and harmony together, then that would be a great gift to the world. Michael Fitzgerald was born in Walsall in 1937 into an Irish Catholic family. At a very early age, he sensed a vocation to mission as a priest, which bore fruit when he joined the Congregation of Men, whose official title is the Missionaries of Africa, but who are more commonly known as the White Fathers from their white habits. Before he was ordained, Michael studied theology at Carthage in Tunisia, and then after ordination in 1961, he continued to study in Rome, and between 1965 and 1968, he took a degree in Arabic at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. He then joined the staff of the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome, serving as its rector from 1972 to 1978. Thereafter, he escaped, albeit briefly, Rome's gravitational pull and managed to find himself doing parish work in the Sudan. However, Rome does have that effect on people, and he was recalled to Rome in 1980 to serve on the General Council of the Missionaries for Africa. Then, in 1986, his service of the wider church began in earnest when he was appointed secretary to the then Secretariat for Non-Christians. The title of this Vatican body was subsequently changed, fortuitously, I'd argue, in 1988 to the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. In 1992, Father Michael was ordained titular Bishop of Nepte in Tunisia, and in 2002, he was appointed president of this Pontifical Council by, the, by Pope John Paul II, and was raised to the rank of Archbishop. The final stage in at least his visible career started in 2006 when Pope Benedict XVI appointed Archbishop Fitzgerald to be nuncio in Egypt, a diplomatic post which he fulfilled at a particularly challenging time for Muslim-Christian relations, or at least Muslim-Catholic relations. Then in 2012, he retired to Jerusalem. Well, he did retire, but in 2019, he came to Liverpool here and joined three other White Fathers to form a new community at the parish of St. Vincent de Paul at the, on the waterfront. There, at the invitation of the Archbishop, they have a particular mission to respond to the needs of the city's growing African diaspora population and to engage and support people of all diverse ethnic origins. So the mission goes on. And now in our city. And Cardinal Fitzgerald and his confreres seek to live out a principle that he himself stated when he said, with today's mobility, there is hardly any region of the world where Christians and Muslims do not come into contact. It is important that we know one another and respect one another and that we work together to face up to the problems that exist in our world today. I am thinking of the attitude towards migration the safeguarding of creation, the questions posed to us by advances in biotechnology and so many other matters of concern. A few months after arriving in Liverpool, and literally as he was in the pulpit in the parish church preaching a homily, the Vatican announced that he was to be created a cardinal. And Michael's response was typical of the man. I hope that being a cardinal won't inhibit other people 
who perhaps knew me before. I don't want to make a fuss. I want to be simple. I think that father, that is Pope, Francis is a very good model. Not making a fuss, however, does not prevent people from recognizing, even formally, the extraordinary contribution that our lecturer has made, not only to the church, but also to the world. The Queen and Nation did it in the 2022 New Year's Honours list, when Cardinal Fitzgerald was named OBE for services to interfaith and interchurch partnership. We at Liverpool hope do it this evening by welcoming him as our distinguished lecturer. So, Cardinal Fitzgerald, thank you for honouring us with your presence, and I invite you now to deliver your lecture entitled Human Fraternity, a Proposal and a Project for Relations Between Christians and Muslims. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, for the invitation to speak here this evening. And thank you, Father McGrail, for all the information that you have given to everybody here. There are no secrets, huh? <laughs> <clears throat> I brought the text of my talk in a, a nice blue folder which says a document on human fraternity. I got this from the secretary of the um, higher committee on human fraternity and there is a copy of the document in it. To go any further I will need help at his glasses. So as you, I'm sure that you know, on the 4th of February in 2019, Pope Francis and Dr. Ahmed Tayyib, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, solemnly signed in Abu Dhabi a document entitled Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. I want to speak about this document and to show that it didn't come out of the blue, I would like to first of all to call attention to its antecedents, examine the contents of the document, briefly, and then say a word about its follow-up. Perhaps it would be useful to say a word about Al-Azhar, because many people don't know what Al-Azhar is. Well, it's often called Al-Azhar Mosque, and it started as a mosque built in 969 in Cairo, the new city of Al Qahira, Cairo, founded by the Fatimids. Now, the Fatimids were Shiites, the Shiite caliphate, in competition with the Sunni caliphate in Baghdad. And so Al-Azhar started as a Shiite institute, but then the Sunnis reconquered Egypt and it became a, a bastion of Sunni thought, a stronghold of Sunni Islam. It is, it is often referred to as Al-Azhar University, and there is a university a renowned center of Islamic studies. 
attracting students from all over the Muslim world. But it extended its faculties to other disciplines, agriculture, education, languages, medicine, and science. So it is a full university. At the same time, there is a network of schools and colleges throughout Egypt. So it is more than a university, it is an institute. I always refer to the Institute of Al-Azhar, not the university. It contains also an important center for Islamic research. Let me say something about the relations between the Holy See and Al-Azhar. As you, you know, the office that I worked in in the Vatican, the Secretariat for Non-Christians, which became the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, was founded in 1964 by St. Pope Paul VI, even before the document on relations with other believers, Nostra Aetate, had been finally approved. The first years of this body were spent in laying the foundations for the work of dialogue, rather than establishing relations with people of other religions. But with Al-Azhar, contact had been made right from the beginning. In March 1965, Cardinal Franciscus Koenig, the Archbishop of Vienna, who was a renowned scholar of religion and one of the leading figures in the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, he delivered a lecture at the University of Al-Azhar on monotheism in the contemporary world. And this was very well received. And then there were visits, visits to Cairo and visits from uh, Al-Azhar to Rome, which continued. The, the council developed bilateral relations with Muslims in different countries, but it found it difficult to continue these bilateral relations. And so taking a leaf out of the, the, the book of the Council for Christian Unity, they decided to set up uh, an organization of international, in an international liaison committee. This was to be with international Islamic organizations of a religious character. This committee was inaugurated in 1995 at the same time as the inauguration of the mosque in Rome. So various dignitaries were coming to Rome for that occasion, and so we were able to have the founding meeting of this international committee. Some people from Al-Azhar attended that meeting, but Al-Azhar was not included in the committee. Because, we said, Al-Azhar is an Egyptian institution. Though it has an international uh, outreach, it still remains a national institute, and so it doesn't fall within the, the criteria for the founding of the committee. That didn't please Al-Azhar. And through the... Holy obstinacy, because I always say that of Pope John the Twenty Third, uh, he was wholly obstinate, uh, wholly without the H. Uh, 
the, the, we were pestered for three years until we signed a special agreement with Al-Azhar. And so we started meeting one year in Cairo and one year in Rome, and uh, these annual meetings. And in the year 2000, as part of his great jubilee program, John Paul II visited Egypt in the steps of Moses, and he went to Al-Azhar, where he was warmly welcomed. Usually, Al-Azhar is very sedate. But for Pope John Paul II, everyone was, was clapping, and they were, they were delighted with his visit. So much so that the organizers of our meetings from the Muslim side said that we should meet every year on or around the 24th of February, which was the date of the visit of Pope John Paul II. I think it's only right to mention that relations with Al-Azhar have not been confined to the Catholic Church. The Anglican Communion has also been engaged in dialogue with this institution. And in an address delivered at Al-Azhar on the 24th of November in 1999, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, proposed an agenda for action, Islam and Christianity in today's world. Now, after the discourse of Pope Benedict XVI in Regensburg, which in September of 2006, which caused consternation in the Islamic world, there was a brief interruption of the dialogue with Al-Azhar, but the annual meetings resumed. However, a further suspension occurred following another discourse of Benedict XVI, this time to the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See in January 2011. Pope Benedict was commenting on bomb attacks on a church in Baghdad and another church in Alexandria. He said that countries should take responsibility for their minorities. The Egyptians didn't like what he said and recalled their ambassador to the Holy See for consultation. The Vatican, unfortunately, didn't have the initiative or the, the gumption to invite me to return to Rome. So I had to stay in Cairo, where I was for a time persona non grata, not very pleasant. With the election of Pope Francis in 2013, there came about a change of attitude. And this led to a visit to Al-Azhar of a delegation from the Holy See in 2016. And in May of that same year, there took place the first visit of a Sheikh Al-Azhar, the present Sheikh Al-Azhar, Dr. Ahmed Tayyib, to the Vatican to meet Pope Francis. And in April of the following year, Pope Francis accepted an invitation to attend an international peace conference organized by the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. Later in 2017, Dr. Ahmed at Tayyib was in Rome to participate in a conference organized by the community of Sant'Egidio. He requested an audience with Pope Francis and was received with a delegation of five persons after the general audience. The meeting, it's Pope Francis himself who told me this, the meeting was rather formal. But Pope Francis invited the imam and his delegation to lunch, and which they accepted. 
He said, do you have anything on your program? And they said, well, not really. So would you come to lunch? Oh, yes. And he said the atmosphere became more relaxed. And it was then that the idea of a joint document was brought up. This wouldn't be the first document produced by Muslims in recent times. There is the message of Amman in 2004, which proposes tolerance and unity within the Islamic world. There was the initiative following the Regensburg speech of Pope Benedict XVI, a common word between us and you. There was the Marrakesh Declaration on the Rights of Minorities in Majority Muslim Countries, and a Cairo document in 2018, or 2016 rather, on citizenship. So all these are a background to the document that I want to talk about. It is a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. A long and rather strange title, really. Was it necessary to specify human fraternity? Is there any other fraternity? But Maybe there is a reason for putting human fraternity, that fraternity is based not on, is seen to be based not on a religious belonging, but on belonging to the human family. I quote, faith in God who has created all human beings. Then it says it is for world peace, all right, and living together. That is not very common in writings in English, but living together. Uh, but in Italian, convivenza is, is quite frequent. And that brings me to the, the language of this document. It must have been elaborated in Arabic first. And one of the persons doing this was the secretary, the private secretary of the Pope, Monsignor Gaid, who was Egyptian. And so he could work with the, the man of Al-Azhar, who was now the secretary of the High Committee, who was asked to work on this document. So they could work together in Arabic, but it had to be translated to Pope Francis. So I presume that it was done in Italian. So the, the two official languages of the document are Arabic first and then Italian, not English. So you can criticize the translation with a, without any difficulty. The introduction to this document consists of three paragraphs. The first states that faith in God, the creator, leads to considering all human beings as brothers and sisters. I know that fraternity sometimes causes difficulty, like fratelli tutti. Some half of the population feel that they're excluded, they're fratelli tutti, but it includes sisters. You'll excuse us for that. Any human language is, is, is um, inadequate. It says that this common belonging to the human family entails a common responsibility for safeguarding creation and supporting all persons, especially the poorest. The second paragraph talks about the way the document was written. 
It refers to several meetings characterized by a friendly and fraternal atmosphere in which the joys, sorrows, and problems of our contemporary world were shared. You can hear Gaudium et Spes in the background of that. Finally, the introduction of references made to progress, both scientific and technical, and in therapeutics, and in the field of communications, but also there is a reference to poverty, inequality, conflict, and extremism. And finally, the introduction offers the document as an invitation, an invitation to unite and work together, and as a guide for future generations to advance a culture of mutual respect in the awareness of the great divine grace that makes all human beings brothers and sisters. So we are made brothers and sisters, and we have the responsibility for living that. The document then goes on with a list, a series of 11 invocations. And the first reads, in the name of God, who has created all human beings equal in rights, duties, and dignity, and who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters, to fill the earth and make known values of goodness, love, and peace. I would say that the Islamic revenant, resonance of that is, is clear. In the Islamic tradition, Every document and every act, in fact, starts with the Quranic invocation, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. If this were a Muslim speaking to you, he would have started with that invocation, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. But the invocations go on to invoke human life, innocent human life, and different categories of people in the name of the poor, in the name of orphans, in the name of widows, refugees, victims of wars, persecution, and injustice. And then it goes on to ideals such as human fraternity, that embraces all human beings, unites them, and renders them equal. There is a further invocation of this fraternity torn apart by policies of extremism and division, by systems of unrestrained profit. And then also it are invoked the ideals of freedom, justice, and mercy. I want to read the final invocation. In the name of God and of everything stated thus far, Al-Azhar al-Sharif and the Muslims of the East and West, together with the Catholic Church and the Catholics of the East and West, declare the adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path mutual cooperation as the code of conduct, reciprocal understanding as the method and standard. A, a resounding declaration, well formulated, but which raises some difficulties which I will discuss later. Let's turn to the contents of the document. I think one of the characteristics of the document, or declaration, a term which is used in the document itself, is that it is wide-ranging. I'll give just a summary of its contents. It evokes the causes of the crises in today's world suggesting the following. A desensitized conscience, 
distance from religious values, individualism, materialism. Of course, it acknowledges advances in science and technology, but these are contrasted with deterioration in the moral sphere. And this is seen, this deterioration is seen to foster frustration, leading to extremism, whether religious or non-religious. And this extremism is itself the source of conflict. And here reference is made to a third world war being fought piecemeal. piecemeal. That's an expression frequently used by Pope Francis. It is added that the conflict is sometimes fueled by narrow-minded economic interests. There's a mention of situations of injustice and catastrophic crises, which meet with an unacceptable silence on the international level. The document underlines the importance of the family as the fundamental nucleus of society, and it states, to attack the institution of the family, to regard it with contempt, or to doubt its important role, is one of the most threatening evils of our era. These words are very strong. The importance of education is underlined, and particularly that of providing children with a solid moral formation. Attention is then turned to the primacy of belief in God, the need to recognize God as the source of the gift of life. Deviation from religious teachings and the manipulation of religions are seen to lead to violence and war. Accordingly, a strong appeal is made, and I quote, to stop using religions to incite hatred, violence, extremism, and blind fanaticism, and to refrain from using the name of God to justify acts of murder, exile, terrorism, and oppression. An important condemnation. The authors, noting that this document accords with previous international documents, express their firm conviction that authentic teachings of religions invite us to remain rooted in the values of peace, freedom of belief, thought, expression, and action is upheld. Recognition is given to pluralism and diversity as willed by God in his wisdom. Justice based on mercy is advocated. Dialogue, both cultural and religious, is encouraged. The protection of places of worship is considered a duty. Terrorism itself is roundly condemned including support for terrorist movements. Full citizenship is called for. Calls are made to respect the rights of women, children, the elderly, and the weak. So, in a, it's a, quite a short document, but it covers all sorts of things. I want to make some reflections on this document. The final invocation cited earlier raises a question about representation. Can there really be a parallel between Al-Azhar al-Sharif and the Catholic Church? The leaders of these two bodies are the joint signatories of the document but their roles are not exactly the same. Francis, as Pope, could be said to represent all Catholics 
of the east and the west, maybe we would say of the north and the south. But Pope Francis would surely not claim to represent all Christians. Dr. Ahmed Tayyib, as Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, certainly doesn't represent all Muslims of the East and West. The existence of divisions within Islam, the Sunni-Shia divide, for instance, would seem to be ignored or at least overlooked. But it could be added that even among Sunni Muslims, the authority of Al-Azhar doesn't go uncontested. A question arises about the concept of universal fraternity. This is a document on human fraternity. Muslims who support this idea of a universal fraternity will quote the Quran, which states, the believers are brothers. That is Quran, Surah 49, verse 10. Of course, that depends now on how you interpret believers. Is, is, does this refer to all who believe in God? Or in an absolute being? Or is it restricted to true believers? In other words, to Muslims only. Another, uh, an interpreter of the Quran, Yusuf Ali, proposes the believers are but a single brotherhood. And he adds in a note, the enforcement of the Muslim brotherhood is the greatest social ideal of Islam. We might be a bit suspicious then about this idea of universal fraternity being re or restricted or unrestricted. Before criticizing that restriction, I think it's good for us as Christians to remember that the earlier practice was to restrict the term brothers to those belonging to the Christian community. This was certainly true up to the time of St. Augustine, who addressed the Donatists, heretics, as his brothers, because they were follow, fellow Christians, though they didn't want to be considered as brothers. But he still said, you are our brothers. What about from the Catholic side? Is there a universal fraternity? This fraternity is not based on religious belonging, but rather on belief in God, the creator of all human beings. I would say that that is the starting point of Nostra Etate, this document, Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions. It states in the first paragraph, all men, excuse me, that's how it was translated at that time, all men form but one community. This is so because all stem from the one stock which God created to people the entire earth, and also because all share in a common destiny, namely God. And the consequences of that are spelt out in paragraph 5 of Nostra Aetate. We cannot truly pray to God the Father of all if we treat any people other than in brotherly fashion, for all men are created in God's image. Man's relation to God the Father and man's relation to his fellow men are so dependent on each other that Scripture says, he who does not love does not know God. Of course, the mention of God as Father might cause difficulties for Muslims because 
the name father is considered as disrespectful, as not observing divine transcendence. So father is not one of the 99 beautiful names of God. But as the disjoint document shows, the idea of common belonging can be developed without mention of the fatherhood of God. There is another question. The pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. That's a quotation from the document. That aroused serious uh, criticism from among Catholic theologians. If they had said the plurality of religions, there would have been no difficulty. There exists de facto a plurality of religions. That's evident. What is questioned is whether this plurality is to be considered de jure, in other words, as directly willed by God. Here again, from the Islamic point of view, there would be no objection at all. Let me give you a quotation from the Quran, very often quoted. If God had so willed, he would have made you one community, but he wanted to test you through that which he has given you. So race to do good. You will all return to God, and he will make clear to you the matters you differed about. Quran, Surah 5, verse 48. In other words, God has made us different so that we could know one another and cooperate and rival each other in good deeds for the benefit of all. What can we say from the Catholic side? We could make the distinction, we have a theologian, we could make the distinction between the direct will of God and God's permissive will. At least that. God has permitted that different religions developed. But I think that something more positive can be said. Based on the documents of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church states clearly in number 16 that the plan of salvation includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. If you talk about the plan of salvation, that is surely the will of God. No? It's what he wanted. And it includes Muslims, and it, it can include people of other religions too. These religious elements come from God because Nostra Aetate says that the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions that it has talked about. And these religious elements come from God. As Pope St. John Paul II has pointed out, the Spirit brings these elements about in human hearts and in the history of peoples, cultures, and religions. An official document of uh, an encyclical, Redemptoris Missio. Let me finish with some brief remarks. I think that this document is Courageous, practical, and realistic, though it is wide-ranging. It's courageous of the two religious leaders to sign this common document 
and express their readiness to engage the members of their respective religions in a process of dialogue. They will surely not be surprised if the document has met with opposition from certain quarters. It's a practical document. I think you will have understood from the summary of its contents that this document is geared more to cooperation in practical matters than to a deepening of theological understanding. It's realistic, it takes into account the change and progress in the world today, but also recognizes the presence of constant conflict and the injustice of inequality. As I've said already, it's very wide ranging, touching on so many different points. It is in that sense, it is an ongoing process. The authors of the document recognize that it is not a definitive statement, but rather an invitation to engage in a work in progress. And that's why I gave in the title, A Proposal and a Project. They pledged to make known the principles contained in this declaration so that they can be translated into policies, decisions, legislative texts. They express the hope that the document may become an object of research and reflection. I say that in this university, Hope University. So it is a hope that is expressed and hopes can be realized. No? This lecture is the realization of a hope, as you said. We planned it several years ago, but uh, it's happening now. So a hope can be expressed. There's an aspiration that uh, the document may constitute an invitation to reconciliation and fraternity among all believers, indeed among believers and non-believers, and among all people of goodwill. That's not my invention, that's a quotation from the document. And for this purpose, an application committee has been set up, the Higher Committee of Human Fraternity. It has 11 members, only two are women, but they are distinct women. There is one Nobel Peace Prize winner, Lema Gbowi, a Liberian peace activist and advocate for women's rights, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. And the other woman in the committee is Irina Bukova, the former director of UNESCO, who is of the Orthodox tradition. There is a representative of the Jewish faith in this committee, Rabbi Bruce Lestig, senior rabbi of the Washington Hebrew congregation. And this is a sign that dialogue and cooperation is to be pursued not only by Christians and Muslims, but by and with others too, whether believers or not. I think that a further sign of outreach within Christian circles is the inclusion in the committee ex officio of the Secretary General of the World Council of Churches. This, I end, this committee has uh, been active. It promoted a day of prayer and fasting for the end of the pandemic. It was instrumental in having the 4th of February recognized by the United Nations Assembly General as the Day of Human Fraternity. It has instituted the Human Fraternity Award and 
it has promoted the building of the Abrahamic house in Abu Dhabi. The Abrahamic house, which will include a synagogue, a mosque, and a church. I would hope that the committee might help to clarify some of the points in the document which remain rather vague. I would say the reference to the authentic teachings of religion, of religions. What are the authentic teachings and what are the unauthentic teachings? The idea of full citizenship also is a bit vague. What is meant by that? But the committee has shown that its aim is to fulfill the program formulated in, I already quoted this, it's a kind of slogan, the adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path, mutual cooperation as the code of conduct, reciprocal understanding as the method and standard. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. You've given us quite a lot to think about there. However, the digestion of that, I think, begins now. So I'm inviting questions from the floor. Um, if you're happy to take them. Yes, sure. Okay. I, if I might ask one to start, because people are probably thinking of their questions. Um, I know these are very early days. Could you tell us what the, the reception has been of this document within the Roman Catholic and, and within the various uh, Islamic communities? I can't tell you very much about that. In fact, um, I think that the document is not well known, so that's why I chose to speak about it, to make it known, and I'm always willing to speak about this. Um, the It has been adopted because... Pope Francis is fully engaged in this, and so his collaborators, um, the present president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, was recently, on the 4th of February, celebrating this day of fraternity in Abu Dhabi with a panel discussion that was brought different people together. So, I don't know that uh, how, how far it has been accepted in the Islamic world, either, in the Muslim world. Um, I must say, I'm retired, so I don't follow these things too much. I should do more, I suppose. Thank you very much. So, we've had a chance to take... Do we have any questions, please, from the floor? Some of you. Yes, yeah. thank you. Sister Anne. Yes. I'm trying to find a way of buying or curing hard coffee. <laughs> <laughs> This is a big volume. It's, it's an annual volume put out by the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies, Islamo-Christiana, and number 45 of the year 2019, which appeared in 2020, is on human fraternity. It has different articles. Of course, they're in different languages. Arabic. You read Arabic, Sistan. Yeah? Yeah? Arabic, English, French, Italian, 
whatever. But uh, anyway. Anyone can spread the word. You can find the document on the internet. You go into WW Vatican Va, and you go into uh, Pope Francis, and you find the reference to this document. In fact, in this volume, you will find, it. well, even in my paper, eventually, you will find the reference to the document. And anyone can reproduce it and make it known. So that's up to us. As brothers and sisters, we have to make this known to our brothers and sisters, not only Christians and Muslims, but also to others as well. I don't have, I don't, I didn't photocopy enough for 60 to give to each one. Yes, sure. It's it's public. Yeah, you can you can copy it as much as you like and study it and then comment on it. Be more than can. It sounds like you. Please do. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've been taking your um, effort to improve the in the article. I thought perhaps um, you were slightly overcompensating. I mean, it, it strikes me that this is a very male document where your attempt to make it inclusive would perhaps go well further than the original document. I'm thinking particularly of the phrase that we, of course, need to look after women, women, children, elderly, and the weak. Um, <laughs> that, that comes in lots of documents. And I, as I read that, I thought, yes, the women won't be happy with that. <laughs> I recognize that. Um, let us hope that the member of the committee, especially Lema Gubowi, who's for women's advocate for women's rights, will be able to get the committee to uh, have a, a different attitude that women are partners rather than poor people who have to be helped. If, if you could just repeat the final section, what role around... Is the role around economic equality? Economic equality. If I can speak, I have no right to speak for the members of the higher committee or uh, for Pope Francis or for Dr. Ahmed Tayyib. I can't really speak for them, but I think that this document is just to stimulate reflection. And so it has to be taken up in different levels. And the economic imbalance and e economic inequality in the world is one that needs to be taken up by different people, not them. They're not going to do it. They are going to inspire people to do it out of common concern for humanity. It's like uh, Laudato Si of Pope Francis uh, on the care of creation. That needs to be taken up, and it is being taken up by so many people, but there is a need to continue in that work. And I think um, on the economic side as well, you notice that they do criticize that conflict comes from uh, over-greedy people. Even even policies that are, I forget the term that is used. But uh, so I think that that is something. You can't concentrate on everything at one time. But you have to take something and it's like the days of, days of the poor, days of women, not poor women, but days, you take up 
one year you take up some aspect and you ask people to concentrate on that. So I think that this would be, but you can suggest it to the committee. Your about the ancient reports, the ancient of brotherhood and sisterhood, you have a little phrase where the God created the God and the created the earth, which is all the equal uncounted mercy. So it's a fundamental concept that of our equality, our fault and our God, is based on our relationship with the created God. And there's a direct relationship between God and God, it's a concept of human rights, the dignity of individuals, etc. And in a sense, an uneasy marriage in God, trying to put two concepts together of our equality based on our child self, the child of God, we are children of God in the world's race. I don't know, an 18th century concept. All I can say is that it took about six months for this document to be written. And it was going back and forwards from Cairo to Rome and back. And then, and as they looked at it, I would presume that the idea of rights would come from the Catholic side because the Muslims don't usually like to talk about rights. They speak rights and duties, and they, they include duties. So that, that's, that comes in. Uh, um, so... <laughs> Obviously, as you suggest, things have to be clarified in this document. They have to be worked out. They're only suggestions. I think that giving, giving a, a direction of ways in which, um, spheres, areas in which cooperation can take place and research and research together. Um, So the Catholic II was an opportunity for the Catholic II to uh, push out the boundaries of understanding of the U.S. foundation, not the God Jackson, the Catholic doctrine, but uh, all those things that were identified um, in the church that existed in the um, uh, Catholic church, but being framed. But uh, actually, this is the doctrine we've been discussing, that predicate of well, I I think I think that the documents of Vatican II are pregnant in a way. They can give birth to new newer ideas, but that is sometimes difficult. Um, in our discussions in the Vatican on documents that our council was producing, uh, we had discussions with, this is the document, uh, Dialogue and Proclamation, which was produced together with the office or the dicastery, the congregation for the evangelization of peoples, so the missionary element, and also the doctrine of the faith. And one of the drafters of the document was an expert in Vatican II. He knew the documents off by heart, and he 
And he would put them together, a statement from one document and a statement from another, and, and draw a conclusion from that. And they would say, no, you can't say that. You can't say that because it isn't stated explicitly in the document. Uh, Pope Francis himself has said that his teaching, including this document, is perfectly in, in conformity with the teaching of Vatican II. And I think he's right. I mean, <laughs> so uh, yes, maybe, maybe I would say yes to your question. But I think if you understand Vatican II well, it, it, it's not something new. It's just a greater clarity on what Vatican II meant. Nuncio, so as the representative of the Holy See in Egypt, I had the rank of ambassador and had to present my letters of credence to President Mubarak. Among the group of us who presented at the same time was the ambassador of Bangladesh, a very distinguished lady. And uh, she was not at all favorable to Al-Azhar. Many Bangladeshis were coming to study in Al-Azhar and she said they were ruined ruined because they spend so much time outside their own country and studying and studying in Arabic that when they came back, they didn't know what to do. They couldn't do anything. And I think that, that, that there are still many students who are coming to Al-Azhar to study, but um, the... The, the, it's, it's the way it teaches and it uh, is not approved by everyone. I would say the same for the Roman universities. Uh, my mother, for instance, when I got a degree from the Gregorian University, that didn't count at all. When I got a degree from London University, oh yes, that was something, yeah. Uh, uh, the Ahmed al-Tayyib, interestingly enough, was a member of the inner council of the party, the political party of uh, Mubarak. When he was made the, before he was made the president, the Imam of Al-Azhar, he resigned from that position but he was still appointed by the government. So the Imam of Al-Azhar is a government import, in appointment. But Dr. Atayeb is trying to gain the independence of Al-Azhar. He wants it to be an independent institution, not dependent on the government and not having to follow government lines. There, there is, there has been, I think, some tension between the, the current president of Egypt, Assisi, and Al-Azhar. I don't know the, the constitution of Egypt, I'm sorry. I haven't studied the constitution of Egypt, so I don't know the, the exact position of Al-Azhar now. But the... I would say that the position of Dr. Atayeb is in some ways comparable to the position of Pope Francis, in that what Pope Francis is doing is not accepted by all members of the church. And what Dr. Ahmed Atayeb is doing is not accepted by all members of Al-Azhar. There is a, a, a group within Al-Azhar that resists the, the actions of its imam, or maybe not openly, 
but at least, in, as one says, in the background. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, which took us to Realpolitik. Um, finally, I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Yazid Said, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. And thank you, Cardinal Fitzgerald. It's a privilege to be able to give a vote of thanks to Cardinal uh, Michael Fitzgerald, not only for his lecture, indeed, as we've heard earlier from Peter this evening, but in appreciation of his tireless um, contributions and works done by him across the years. In his life and ministry, uh, he has covered great distances. And I understand that this last year, uh, notwithstanding the current uh, restrictions, he was still covering great distances, marked in the climax of the year with a well-deserved acknowledgement by Her Majesty the Queen. I wanted to begin in giving thanks to this with a story um, from Jerusalem where Cardinal Fitzgerald lived. He lived uh, not very far from the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, and it's in that Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, if you visit, on the wall of the office of the Patriarch himself hangs a large portrait in oil. It's not a icon of Christ Pantocrator, as you might expect, nor is it a venerable patriarchal predecessor. It's not a Christian uh, portrait at all. It is an oil painting of a seated, turbaned, alim scholar holding not one but two staff of Muslim religious office. He stares directly ahead of him with a stern and powerful uh, look as a judge, a qadi. And it's a kind of look that you might find in the pages of medieval Islamic literature. This painting of this qadi in Jerusalem around the year, comes from around the year eight, 1860 to 61 when an, uh, a sectarian earthquake, you might say of about 7.5 or so in Middle Eastern history scale, struck the region of greater Syria. The Christians of the region became the target of Muslim mobs. Um, and as the tremors from that earthquake reached Jerusalem, it was our friend in the painting, the powerful and dignified judge, the Qadi, who stepped forward and decided he would have none of it. The Christians of Jerusalem will not be touched. And so it came to pass that his act, his fraternal let's say, protective act, was recognized by another, a thank you note, if you like, in oil, still hanging today in the office of the Christian patriarch. So that story, I think, reminds us that we can only understand, and I think that what's, that's what came across in the talk today, uh, in the lecture of Cardinal Fitzgerald, that we can only understand how we make a common future of fraternity if we remember and understand our history well. 
And that, of course, is a history of both conflict as well as of convergence and common witness. The Vatican and Al-Azhar coming together or cooperating should indeed provide the effect of a different kind of earthquake, potentially. But of course, it's impossible to think of that initiative in bringing a Middle Eastern institution such as Al-Azhar uh, without thinking of the developments nearby in the Middle East. Because at the time of these developments, of, the, of these agreements, or these signing of uh, declarations, what was happening or was unfolding, as you probably will remember, is the, uh, the death, the killing, and the starvation of the children of Yemen, the victims of a terrible conflict between Sunnis and Shiites. When the Pope signed the document in the UAE, I seem to remember Saudi Arabia executed a leading Shiite scholar in its own territories. So it's important to remember that one hopes from such events that they would have some earthquake effect in the wider context in which they are signed. Uh, Cardinal Fitzgerald remembered earlier if leading initiatives towards this uh, docu document, one of which was the A Common Word document, and he and I have contributed to that uh, document earlier with a publication of another book on that uh, initiative, which I actually brought with me here, so I hope you don't mind this shameless plug. Um, which was edited by me and my colleague from Tübingen University, who was a student of uh, Cardinal Fitzgerald himself. <clears throat> Unlike him, I'm afraid I don't have the same level of humility, I tend to uh, maintain the humility of, let's say, Renaissance cardinals. Uh, <clears throat> but in that contribution to the book that I've just mentioned, as well as in this lecture, Father Michael has engaged with honesty and openness on the history and the story of, of, of these initiatives. He doesn't go simply with the fashionable assumption that calls for taking away the unnecessary and what you might call the dangerous disagreements between Muslims and Christians, what the uh, Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor called in his magisterial book, A Secular Age, the subtraction. Some people seem to say, take away the unnecessary and dangerous additions that religion has made to ordinary human common sense or rationality, and you will recover the essentially human. This has affected certain understanding of interreligious engagement. Take away the dangerous extras. Identify universal and rational elements, and you will find peace that the secularists imagine will arrive once religion itself has been ushered off the stage. There are dangers to this assumption and Cardinal Fitzgerald is fully aware of these. If we take as a starting point the idea that what matters in any human activity is a primitive natural set of attitudes or beliefs, that the developments of human history just complicates things, we end up with a very eccentric view of history itself, as if we need to unlearn what history had led us to think or feel. And Islam and Christianity, which emphasize the central and normative importance of central events in history for their identity and distinctiveness, to make that claim would be a very uh, particularly odd thing to do.
So our challenge, I think, of continuing this process of fraternity have to do with avoiding this strategy of negating differences, denying history. To say that Muslims and Christians and others converge on fraternity is not to say that fraternity is a neutral basis on which doctrine are doctrines are subsequently added. But at the same time, the other important element that came up from this lecture, as my examples from the Middle East earlier have meant, uh, suggested, this is not just an empty call for a pious cliche either, as the Cardinal himself emphasized. There, it's significant, it's courageous, is there to remind us in the first place that maybe fraternity is not where we are. How does that affect us here? Westerners may perceive Islam globally as a powerful and threatening, but they don't begin to feel what it is to, what it is like to belong in the West to what is locally a minority, economically challenged, culturally marginalized, or the object of fear and prejudice. For the Islamist agitator might see the opposite, might see a huge Western conspiracy aimed at destroying Islam, and doesn't see that a Western liberal often only wants to be left alone not to destroy anything. So many of our moral standoffs seem to be a confrontation of mirror images. So thank you, uh, Father Michael, for doing what you do. Um, and if I may say so, for adding to the right tapestry of that civil understanding of life in this city, bearing witness to such a conviction of vision that needs robust defense uh, in all your work and in our various meetings. You have shown great fraternity. You have retained calm and perspective and have always um, apprehended the issues at hand with clear, and if I may say so, quizzical eyes, deeply informed and intelligent view. And that's been extremely refreshing for a good deal of us Anglicans who often think of themselves in a chronically depressed manner. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yazid. So I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Um, as the Vice Chancellor said, we're delighted that we can actually get back into the round of engaging face to face, even behind the masks. Um, and I look forward to us gathering again for our next distinguished lecture. Thank you again.